Canadian lawyer and an educator. My background includes postgraduate education in international law. I was also a general legal counsel for a multinational. I've taught business law and was a consultant in developing countries. From my experience, I realized that the traditional model of teaching could be improved. You'll learn better if there's a multi-sensory learning process with a combination of visual, audio, and written material. As a result, I've designed this unique course for law or business students, business managers, or teachers. It has three main elements. There's a video, a guide, and teacher or student support. Each module is designed for a two-hour class. For the first half, there's a videoed lecture of about 50 minutes on the subject. You may pause it or listen to it again. The second element we offer you or your class is a guide for the next half of the class. There are suggested readings, websites, discussion questions, and more. This means lots of opportunity to explore the subject and anchor the information in a smaller self-directed learning environment or with a class. The third element we offer you is a range of options for teacher support and training. By the end, you will understand what the fundamentals are of international business transactions and the practical application, such as with international sales contracts, intellectual property, and product liability. You will learn how international law is made and what the sources are including in the exploding areas of environment and human rights law, and how to keep on top of it. You will find out how international business transactions are enforced and how disputes are resolved. You can get all the course elements in a variety of formats to suit your technological situation. You can download, or where internet is unreliable, get hard copies or DVDs. To learn more about fundamentals of international business transactions and about our other courses, here is our contact information. Today is an introductory class. We're going to look at basic principles of international law. These principles are the basis of international business transactions. So here are some of our topics for today. The definition of international law, the concept of sovereignty, the sources of international law, the doctrine of jurisdiction, what state responsibility is, how countries are trying to harmonize laws through voluntary codes, uniform laws, and model laws. Well, first of all, what is law? Well, simply put, law is a system governing behavior that's backed up by some way to enforce it. There's a person in charge or an institution such as a government. There must be an obligation, a duty, to follow law in order for it to be considered as existing in the first place. So law is different from a moral or an ethical code. So the concept of enforcement is important to the definition of law. Now there are many systems of law in fact, each country has its own unique and individual way of making and enforcing law. Yet, in the world, there are general categories of legal systems. These categories or groups share some characteristics. The two main Western legal ones are the common law system and the civil law system. Most countries that were part of the British Empire have common law systems, and most of Europe, for example, uses a civil law system. 
Sometimes two systems exist side by side within a country, and there are other systems based on beliefs or custom. Many countries have these, sometimes in unique blends with common law and civil law systems. We will be looking at these two main Western legal systems in more detail later, as some concepts are essential in international business transactions. So now that we have an idea of what law and legal systems are, well, what is international law? How is international law any different? Well, international law is distinctive in many ways. First of all, countries usually have a central place where law is made, such as a legislative body. In international law, however, there's no central place where international law is made or enforced. There's no chief parliament. However, the United Nations is an important central organization. And there is also no one source for international law. There's no single place to look for what it is. Well, so what is it then? Well, the term international law actually means a collection of treaties, customs, and multilateral agreements. They govern the dealings of countries and multinational businesses. And countries have an obligation to bring their laws into line with international law. To understand how international law has evolved, we must first look at the international law concept of sovereignty. Now in all recorded history, as you know, there have been groups called nations, states, or countries, and each of these nations has sovereignty. Sovereignty is a foundation principle of international law. It means that each country has the right to control its own affairs within its borders. It can make laws and rules to control what happens within its territory. It can enforce that law in some way, such as through the courts. Sovereignty includes the idea that all nations in the world are legally equal. No one has any more power than the other. No one nation has the right to tell another what to do. Sovereignty also includes respect by countries for each other's laws and court decisions. Now, bear in mind that these are general principles and there's countless exceptions as we'll see throughout the course. We know that the issue of sovereignty arises constantly in international affairs. For example, groups of people seek autonomy. That means the right to control their own affairs, free of control of another sovereign. Autonomy can mean many things. It can mean independence, self-government, or self-rule. In other words, people within an established country can struggle for their own sovereignty. For example, Aboriginal or Indigenous peoples the world over seek sovereignty over resources in their traditional lands based on their long established control over the territory. These and many more struggles the world over involve the international law concept of sovereignty. But from earliest times, there's been trade between nations. And what do traders want? Well, they want predictability and law and order when they're buying from or selling products to people in another country. So a set of early rules developed among countries. These grew out of custom, and so they became known as customary rules. These customary rules are the basis of business law as we know it today. Now, one of these customary rules is that a business must follow the laws of the country in which it's doing business. Because, as we've seen, countries have sovereignty over what happens in their territory.
So we're starting to see the building blocks of international law and international business transactions. So to summarize this short preliminary section, countries technically have sovereignty and are all powerful over what takes place inside their borders, although we're going to see many, many limits on this. Yet, unless a country lives in complete isolation, it will have to deal with other countries. Its borders touch other nations. There's trade between countries. So the earliest rules started based on the need for fairness and predictability in encouraging trade. This brings us to the legal concept of jurisdiction. This is a crucial concept in international business transactions. Having jurisdiction means having the power or control over something. For example, a country has jurisdiction over its citizens and what happens within its borders. It has jurisdiction to negotiate treaties with other countries. Jurisdiction is a flexible idea that changes with the circumstances. Jurisdiction can be taken on and given up. For example, countries in Europe had jurisdiction over certain matters. When a country joined the European Union, the EU, it gave up jurisdiction of some of those things. It accepted the jurisdiction of the EU over some matters. So it's important to realize that jurisdiction can be given away, refused, or accepted. Now, when a court decides it will hear a case, it takes on or assumes jurisdiction over the case. That is, the court decides that in the circumstances, it is the right place for a case to be heard. The court takes on the authority to hear the evidence, require witnesses to show up, and to make a decision. Let's give an example in order to fully understand the idea of jurisdiction. As an illustration, let's just say that an American company hires employees in Cambodia to produce clothing. The company must follow Cambodian law while doing business in Cambodian territory. That's the recognized principle of international law called sovereignty, which we just talked about. Now, if the company doesn't, let's say the company commits a crime of some kind, a Cambodian court would be within its rights to take control of a case. In other words, it would assume jurisdiction. This makes sense because the company is doing business in Cambodia and is actually present there. The Cambodian court could make a decision or judgment against the company and expect that courts in other countries would enforce it. So this is an example of territorial jurisdiction. So a country's courts will assume or accept jurisdiction over a case that involves its territory. Countries will cooperate with each other under the umbrella of sovereignty and the concept of jurisdiction. They will respect and recognize court or tribunal judgments made in another nation. They may take on the orders as though they were made in their own courts. Does any other country have jurisdiction or legal authority over the American company in a case like this? Well, in our example, let's say the company's home office is in the United States. Does the U.S. have jurisdiction over the company if it breaks the laws of a foreign country? The answer is yes. A country has authority over its nationals, whether they're people or businesses. So an American company could be called before a U.S. court for failing to obey the law of another country. This is called nationality jurisdiction. In other words, countries are acting within their sovereign rights when they assume legal authority over people or companies who live there.
Now, before we go any further, bear in mind that any situation depends on the facts, and these are general principles only. There are countless variations in facts with many possible differences in the way individual courts may look at a situation. As a practical matter, enforcing a country's orders in another country is filled with problems. Whether or not courts outside Cambodia, in the case we just talked about as an example, would actually do this depends on many things. And we're gonna talk more about this later. Courts are generally very careful before they take jurisdiction in the first place. They will cautiously decide whether it's reasonable to decide a case. While we're going to try to avoid legal Latin terms as much as possible, coming up is one you must know, as it will come up many times as we talk about international business transactions. In deciding issues of jurisdiction, the courts look at something called the doctrine of forum convenience. Well, let's break the term down. Forum means place, and convenience means convenient. So the idea in translation is, is this the convenient place to decide the case? So when a case is first brought before a court, the judges will look at many things, all part of the doctrine of forum convenience. Let's take the fictional Cambodia garment case, for example. The court might consider facts like these. What are the links to Cambodia? Is there any country that has stronger ties to whatever the situation may be? What is the nationality of the people or the companies involved? And where do they actually live? And so on. As we'll see throughout this course, this process of forum convenience is important in international business transactions. Businesses must know which court or tribunal will resolve problems. Let's just say that a court accepted jurisdiction over a business dispute. If a foreign court later decides it didn't have good reason to accept jurisdiction in the first place, the foreign court will not allow the order to be enforced. This could mean a huge delay, major costs, legal expenses, loss of profit, and on and on. So deciding where and how to have disputes resolved that is, the doctrine of forum convenience is a fundamental issue in international business transactions. So we've seen that countries have sovereignty over what happens in their territory. We've also looked at the rules about when courts will take jurisdiction over cases. If a country believes its sovereignty is being interfered with, it will become protectionist. It may complain to international tribunals or courts or retaliate, get back at the other country somehow. Despite this, the reality is that countries are cooperative for the most part in the creation and enforcement of international law. This often involves compromises in sovereignty. This is illustrated by the fact that there are hundreds of treaties and more cases than ever before are being referred to busy international courts. So before we go any farther, let's look at some examples of effective working of international law. Here's one. The International Court of Justice, the ICJ, interprets treaties on the laws of the sea and countries follow those decisions. Also, members of the World Trade Organization, the WTO, honor their commitments. They also follow the decision of WTO's group that settles disputes. Now, why is this? Why do countries surrender some of their sovereignty? Why do they agree to hand over cases to international courts or tribunals and then usually follow decisions, even if they are unhappy with them? Well, there are many reasons. For example, 
a country probably entered into a treaty because it was a good idea. If the country lives up to its promises, other countries are more likely to do the same. There's an expectation of mutual benefits. Also, there is international political pressure. Countries exert power through diplomacy to encourage each other to respect promises. This is an effective tool. There's also the desire for mutual favors. Countries want to create goodwill. They're like people. They value their reputations among each other. Also, countries are concerned about globalization and what foreign businesses do within their territory. There are issues of pollution, bribery, and employment, just to name a few. Some developing countries really want to find a way to protect their people and their resources. Yet another reason why countries live up to their commitments is a recognized rule of international law called the rule of law. This is the next foundation principle of both national law and international law that we're going to look at now. The principle of the rule of law says very simply that laws will be respected. Here are some main parts of the rule. Every person, organization, and government, and this includes business, is subject to the law. Next, only punishments in agreement with legal principles can be handed out. And finally, everyone has the right to go to court. The rule of law applies both inside countries and between countries. So if your country passes a law, there is an expectation that the law will be respected within the country. And in the same way, all countries are expected to honor the rule of law in their dealings with each other. So the rule of law is an international law principle underlying intercountry relationships. Countries expect that each other will follow international law. Businesses are also expected to support the rule of law. The rule of law is so basic to international law that it's included in the Charter of the United Nations. As the course goes on, we will talk more about the rule of law, governments, and business. Let's look at a case to show what we've discussed so far. We will call it simply the Ecuador case. But first, a note about the name of the company involved. The name was originally Texaco. Now later on, Chevron bought Texaco. So bear in mind that the companies now are legally the same, and Chevron is now the name of the company being sued. But it was Texaco who created the problem in the first place. So a bit about Ecuador. It's a sovereign country in South America. There are more than a dozen indigenous or native groups there who go back 11,000 years and they make up a quarter of the population. Ecuador is a hugely varied nation. It spans the equator. It touches the ocean on the west side of the continent, and it includes the famous Galapagos Islands. It also has mountains and tropical rainforest. The country has huge oil and gas deposits in the tropical rainforests. In the 1960s, the U.S. company Texaco had started oil development in Ecuador. It began major shipments of oil in 1972 after a pipeline was built across the country. People who became plaintiffs in lawsuits, as well as worldwide supporters, claim the following that Texaco released billions of gallons of toxic wastes, gas, and crude oil into the environment, that water was polluted, and people's health was harmed with increased rates of illness like cancer and birth defects. 
A large section of the rainforest is now one of the world's most contaminated industrial sites. In the 1990s, Texaco left Ecuador after doing some cleanup and the government released it of any further responsibility. Texaco had offices in the United States and it was there that many of the decisions were made. So a group of Ecuadorans sued in the United States on the basis of nationality jurisdiction. Chevron did not want the case heard in the United States. As we have seen in talking about sovereignty, courts are careful about accepting jurisdiction over cases involving other countries. Like national governments, they respect sovereignty, that is, the right and the duty of a country to have a local case decided in its own courts. We have just looked at jurisdiction and how courts decide whether they have jurisdiction over a case. Was this a purely local matter that should be heard in Ecuador? Well, the U.S. court looked at the circumstances. As we talked about earlier, it considered the doctrine of forum convenience. All evidence in the case was obviously in Ecuador, such as the medical reports of the people who lived there and all the injury and the damage occurred there. So in 2001, the court made a decision in Chevron's favor and dismissed the lawsuit. But that wasn't the end of the matter. The lawsuit was started over, this time in Ecuador. And just recently, an Ecuador court gave a judgment against Chevron to the tune of 18 billion. The judgment is the largest award ever made by any court anywhere. Now what's going to happen to this judgment is still up in the air. How is it going to be enforced anyway? Chevron has no assets in Ecuador. Chevron is using many tactics to fight the registration of the order in those countries where it has assets. The case has become a huge global battlefield and is being fought at many public, political, corporate, and legal levels. Anyone can find plenty of information on the internet, court documents, websites devoted to the issue, both sides, as well as pictures, videos, and so on. So what can we see by looking at this case? Well, for one, it shows the principle of sovereignty. The Ecuador court has taken sovereignty over a case involving its natural resources, its territory, and its citizens. And the United States was unwilling to take over a case with close connection to another country. Second, the case demonstrates the process courts go through in deciding whether a case should be heard in their court. They consider the doctrine of forum convenience. Where is the evidence? What country has the closest link to the facts? The case also shows how hard it can be to enforce a judgment. Now, this is an important consideration in international business transactions, and we're going to talk more about it in a later class. Let's now, though, take a quick look at the international law concept of state responsibility and how this is important to business. To begin with, Countries have some very obvious responsibilities in international law called state responsibility. Countries have certain duties. They have to safeguard people against slavery or genocide, for example. They have to protect the environment against massive pollution. So what if a company does something against state responsibility with the approval of a government? For example, there are allegations that some governments have loaned their armies or helicopters to a company in order to stop people from complaining or demonstrating about something, such as building a dam or mining. Now, in cases like that, sometimes what a company does 
can be interpreted as really being the actions of the government. So the government can be in violation of its responsibility towards its own citizens while promoting or protecting business. And what about the company? Is it off the hook if the government approved certain activities contrary to international law? No, the company is not in the free and clear. A government's support or even active participation in a business project may not be enough to make something legal which is illegal in international law. For example, let's say that a country and a company are partners in a business joint venture. The company carries out human rights abuses during the project. The government turns a blind eye or perhaps even backs the company up in some way. In a case like this, the country could be held to be responsible for the actions of the company if it approved or allowed the actions. And the company and even its officers could also be held responsible. The approval of the government may not be a defense. So state responsibility means that countries have certain duties in international law. Let's now turn our attention to sources of international law. Where do we look when we want to know what the international law is on some subject? Well, there are four main places to look for international law. First, international treaties. Second, international custom. Third, the general principles of law that are recognized by nations. And fourth, court decisions, and the teachings of the most highly qualified people of the various nations. Now the practice is for these to be applied in the order listed. So let's look at them in that order. The first source is treaties. Well, what is a treaty? It is simply a voluntary agreement between countries or some special international organizations. Now, a treaty may be bilateral or multilateral. An example of a bilateral treaty is one that just deals with trade between two countries. An example of a multilateral treaty is the North American Free Trade Agreement, or NAFTA, signed by Canada, the United States, and Mexico. A treaty could be called by other terms, so look for these. Protocol, Declaration, Charter, Covenant, and so on, there's many more. But they are all essentially the same thing. They're an agreement freely entered into by countries. The countries are called parties. The party countries rely on each other to live up to the terms of the treaty. There are a vast number of treaties about countless subjects. One of the most significant to international business is the UN Convention on Contracts for the International Sale of Goods, the CISG. We will discuss this treaty in detail in a later lecture. So how does a treaty become law and affect business? Well, here's how that happens. First of all, the treaty terms have to be agreed upon. Representatives of countries may meet for years to iron out the details. Once a version is agreed upon, authorized representatives of the various party countries then sign the treaty. But each country has its own laws about the next step, which is called ratification. That is when the internal government of the country takes the treaty to its government and has it formally approved. Once this step is taken, the laws of the country must be changed or created to conform to the new law. So an important thing to know is that there is a difference between signing a treaty and ratifying it. Also, a party country may disagree with a section and enter what is called a reservation. 
meaning it does not intend to comply with that particular part. Some treaties allow reservations and others don't. So not all parts of a treaty may apply to all the party countries. Later on, that country may agree to the previously rejected sections. This makes tracking of signing and ratification complex. But the United Nations keeps track of this process and the status of all the treaties is available online. As well, countries or the organizations they set up may continue to work on treaties, refining them and producing codes or rules. Again, these may or may not be signed and ratified by all the countries involved. Treaty law is important for businesses. First, treaties provide certainty and confidence for business by establishing rules that are followed. Second, treaties allow governments to help business. Let's say that a country breaks a treaty section, harming a Canadian business. Canada has a number of options. One is to ask the government to take action against the other country in the ICJ, the International Court of Justice. Or the treaty may set out a way to resolve the dispute and the government could support the business in applying for dispute resolution. Sometimes the government may decide to negotiate a resolution outside the court or the dispute resolution process. Unfortunately, sometimes the government does nothing at all and having a treaty is ineffective. This might be what the government decides to do if diplomatic relations between the country are tense or delicate for some reason. So sometimes a treaty does not give as much protection for business as it hopes for. This is because a country's involvement in a treaty is purely voluntary. For example, while all members of the UN can use the ICJ to resolve treaty disputes, not all countries have accepted this. So we can see that treaties are the most important source of international law and may provide confidence in international business transactions. But we also see that treaties may have limited impact if they aren't signed, ratified, or relied upon. The second of the four main sources of international law is custom. Custom is a long established practice or tradition accepted by nations the world over as being law. It then becomes customary international law. For example, it is an international crime against humanity for a country to permit slavery. This is a crime under customary international law. So even if there were a country somewhere that legalized slavery, that law would be against international law. It violates customary international law, which nations the world over are expected to follow. Many rules of customary international law make their way into treaties. So in the example we have given, there are actually treaties dealing with slavery. So how do courts decide if something is customary international law? Many sources are looked at. Is it an unspoken rule, simply assumed by nations? Is there a pattern of treaties based on tradition or custom? Are there written political speeches or government policies that are based on the tradition? Are there court decisions about it? So, Customary international law can develop and change over time. The third source of international law is general principles of law recognized by nations as valid throughout the world. Well, what is this? What does that mean? This is best illustrated by an example. Most legal systems accept the idea that a wronged person should be compensated for their loss. This is what is called a norm, a standard, or a rule. No nation denies this. 
So it is a general principle of law recognized by nations. The fourth source of international law is judicial decisions and the teachings of the most highly qualified publicists of the various nations. Let's have a look at what that means. As international law evolves, a growing number of legal opinions and judgments is developing. For example, the ICJ is the main court for the United Nations. Over the years, it has decided a number of cases. It is gradually building up case law. This means it has previously decided cases that can be referred to in resolving current ones. But courts are not the only sources for decisions. Many treaties have their own dispute resolution bodies. For example, as we mentioned earlier, the WTO has its own way of resolving disputes. These decisions, over time, become part of accepted international law. Countries accept and follow the decisions. So decisions and teachings are the last source looked at for international law. But it's becoming more important as more scholars write about international law and international courts and tribunals are making more decisions. We're now going to talk about methods being used to simplify and clarify international law. You can see the huge differences in legal systems and how this could be confusing for businesses with activities in more than one country. There have been many efforts to codify law. In other words, organizations are trying to agree on rules, have them written out in codes, and have these codes accepted by countries the world over. The more countries that agree to these voluntary codes, the more common they become, and the more business can rely upon them. In addition to international codes, there's a strong movement to create uniform laws. Uniform laws are worked out between representatives from countries as a way to fairly smooth out the differences in their laws. They are written in an effort to bring laws into harmony with each other. Once again, these uniform laws are agreed to voluntarily by countries and only apply to countries that agree to them. But they are increasingly important as the more countries that adopt these uniform laws, the greater confidence among businesses about what the law is and how it will be enforced. Let's look at an example of a uniform law. The United Nations Convention on Contracts for the International Sale of Goods, or the CISG. As we've seen, the word convention is another word for treaty. So this is a treaty. It contains a uniform international sales law. It has been ratified by dozens of countries who make up most of the world's trade. They're shown in color on this slide. It is one of the most successful international uniform laws. In addition to codes and uniform laws, there is another category that illustrates cooperative efforts among countries to resolve differences and create international law. These are model laws. Model laws are simply examples that countries can follow. Countries will send representatives to work them out, and when completed, the laws can then be adopted by any country. An example of a model law that has gained wide international acceptance is a law on commercial arbitration, which we will discuss in more detail later. International organizations are significant to international business. Many of them just work on issues of international commerce. There are two main categories of international organizations. There are intergovernmental organizations, or IGOs. These are organizations set up by one or perhaps many countries 
The United Nations itself is an international organization. Here are some other examples of other international organizations. These ones directly concerned with business. There's the WTO, the World Trade Organization. There's NAFTA that regulates regional trade. We said there were two kinds of international organizations. The second kind is non-governmental organizations or NGOs. Examples are the International Air Transport Association, the International Committee of the Red Cross, Amnesty International. We'll discuss the work of IGOs and NGOs throughout the course, as many are very important to business. To illustrate some of the concepts we've been talking about, we're now going to look at the Trail Smelter case. It is probably the best known environmental law case. The pollution and legal proceedings have been going on for a century and both continue to this day. It's impossible in the time we have to completely analyze the case. So we're only going to look for illustrations on how international law is made, the role of international organizations and the importance of treaties. But first, let's take a quick look at what happened. Trail is the name of a city in British Columbia, Canada, just 15 kilometers north of the US-Canada border. The massive Columbia River flows through here into the United States. An industrial facility called a smelter was built in Trail, which processes the minerals lead and zinc. The operations have resulted in widespread contamination. The smelter's owner is commonly called Tech, and that is the name we will use today. The first issue that came to the notice of the public in the early part of the last century was the toxic air emissions from the smokestacks, which caused injury in Canada and in the United States. American farmers sued the company, claiming injury to their animals and crops. Well, because there was an international boundary between the source and the injury, the governments of both countries became involved. Canada and the US cooperated in referring the case to the International Joint Commission, or IJC. The IJC is an independent international organization established by the two countries under a treaty called the Boundary Waters Treaty of 1909. The IJC made a recommendation in 1932 for settlement, but the settlement was far less than the Americans expected and was rejected. Eventually, the two countries signed a treaty to set up an arbitration panel to decide the issue. We will be looking at arbitration later in the course, but for now, just know that arbitration is a way to solve disputes through people appointed by the parties, and they're called arbitrators. The arbitrators can act like judges, hearing evidence and reading documents. Arbitration is often an economical and fast way to resolve a dispute. Well, in this case, the arbitration decision was a milestone in international law. First of all, it was the first time an international dispute had been settled by arbitration. Secondly, it established the international law principle known as the polluter pays principle. In other words, countries must not harm other ones through pollution. The polluter pays principle has become a cornerstone of environmental law and regulation. So international law was created, which has become a precedent for courts and tribunals. This means it's an example for courts to follow if a similar case arises. But the case did not stop there. The pollution from water and air emissions continued and is still the subject of lawsuits. 
Well, what is the significance of this case for business in terms of today's class? First of all, it shows some efforts at cooperation between countries when trying to resolve disputes that cross their borders and affect their citizens. It also illustrates the importance of international organizations that are in place to implement treaties. In this case, it was the IJC, the International Joint Commission, set up under a bilateral treaty between Canada and the United States. It shows how international law is made. In this case, it was the polluter pays principle and how it then becomes a precedent which is later applied throughout the world. In fact, the principle later became part of an international treaty. Unfortunately, the case illustrates failures in international law, which we'll discuss at another time. This brings us to the end of today's lecture part of the class. We have covered a lot of material in creating a foundation for international business transactions. We've looked at what international law is and why it's important to business. We've also discussed sovereignty and how trade became the foundation of international commercial law. We've talked about the Ecuador case and looked at how issues of jurisdiction are decided by courts. We outlined the four sources of international law. We have reviewed efforts of the international community to create international organizations, as well as codes, uniform laws, and model laws. And finally, we talked about some of the points in an actual case, the Trail Smelter case, where international law was created. In our next class, we're going to continue building a foundation for international business transactions. We will talk about human rights law, which is an exploding legal area of major interest to business. Here is information about our course, today's class, and our contact information. Thanks for being with me.